Welcome to Real Christianity. Today we are talking about the Bible's position on tattoos, marijuana, and alcohol. Lots of questions around these topics. They're kind of, uh, you can almost make a show out of every one of them, but we thought let's just do a brief um, exposition on each one of them really quick. Really brief. Yeah, really <laughs> brief. And so um, before we get started, guys, we just broke 4,000 reviews on iTunes. I mean, I don't even know what to say because there's not many shows that have 4,000 plus reviews. And so they're, they're really encouraging. Um, and just thank you. So if you guys haven't left a review and you're a regular listener to the show, you just go to iTunes, you just tap the stars. If you write something, great. If you just tap the stars, that's great too. Um, if you guys haven't heard, uh, we opened enrollment, which is continuously open. Uh, at ultimatemarriage.com. So you can start your six-week marriage journey. If you wanted to just really try to get a biblical marriage established in your home, if you're like, hey, you know, our, our marriage, we've just been kind of doing it our own way. Uh, it's time to really go back to scripture and see how we could do this, how to strengthen our marriage, have a thriving marriage. Check out ultimatemarriage.com. There's a great video there for you to watch. Uh, for the next eight weeks, um, well, actually, first I should say Veronica's back. I'm she, back. Yeah, you've been gone for two weeks. I have. You probably enjoyed that as your introvertness. Just a little break, yeah. Yeah. It was nice. <laughs> so <laughs> glad to be back, though. Also, another point that I want to make on Ultimate Marriage before you move on is for the people that are listening that are engaged, it would make a pretty good, uh, I guess, premarital type course to go through, too. There are definitely topics in there that are just for people who are married, um, but we cover a lot of ground, I think, that would really help those who are getting married yeah if you ex I, I think it's probably stronger than the average pre premarital course that that people go through um yeah and it, you just have to take it in consideration that these are some roles that that get yeah it out. is for married people um yeah we've had a couple of people um who we've done their premarital counseling and you know we obviously touch on a lot of those topics in the ultimate marriage program and they're talking to their other friends who are in the same season of life who are engaged and going through premarital and they're like we never talked about any all or all of my friends have never talked about any of these things with their premarital counselors and i'm just like it's crazy yeah so we hit anyway. some deep topics mm -hmm. and it's uh, really fun and engaging and great questions and discussions and it's only six weeks so mm -hmm. ultimate marriage.com uh for the next eight weeks actually after this episode um we're gonna do a bunch of 30 minute episodes, 20 to 30 minute episodes. Uh, Veronica is actually going to interview me uh, from one topic of each of the eight chapters of my new book, Real Christianity, um, How to Be Bold for Christ in a Culture of Darkness. And that book is available at relearnchurch.org forward slash RC. Um, and we're going to just break down some of these topics. I think there's going to be some really great episodes in there. And, um, we might also do uh, a break in there to hit another off topic in the middle of it. Who knows? But we are going to do several episodes talking about the book. And I think it'll be uh, edifying and hopefully encourage you guys to pick up a copy and take a read. It's not going to be super promotional. It's going to be really topical, scriptural, based on some really important issues that we can bring in uh, that I think it make it relevant for uh, the episode. So just want to give you guys a heads up on that. Okay, so dropping, dropping, jumping, jumping into today's. I like dropping too. Dropping, hey, all right. Anyway, um, jumping into today's topic, um, we're gonna hit tattoos first. So, we have several Christian friends who have tattoos, and we get this question pretty common uh, question asked frequently: if s tattoos. Sorry, I'm just getting very tongue tied. If tattoos are sinful or if they are unbiblical. Mm -hmm. um, and just for the record, Dale and I personally do not have any tattoos. I'm sure several years ago we probably considered it. Um, I've considered some really dumb tattoos. <laughs> I've thought about it, but I never like actually seriously thought about it. And I was like, okay, I, I might do this because I was just too afraid to actually go through what it takes. To I was the guy that almost got the stars in the back of my elbows. Oh my gosh. I'm so glad you didn't do yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Lots of dumb ideas. I'm sure that we... Uh, you know, the Lord graciously allowed us to escape to escape that. Um, but since we don't have a ton of time, we're just going to dive straight in. So, Dale, what does the Bible say about tattoos and should Christians get them? Um, yeah. So first, if you have tattoos, don't worry, I'm not going to call you a great sinner. 
uh, and that you have permanent sin on your body. That's not what we're going to say here, so you can rest assured. I am going to give you guys just a biblical perspective on that, and you get to do with it, uh, do with it what you will. Um, second, I, I don't think the, the discussion's really about sin. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's necessarily a sin issue. I, I think it's really more of a wisdom discussion. Um, and, you know, in, in order for something to be sin, there needs to be really a scriptural command prohibiting that activity within the covenant that we're in. We're in the new covenant. And I say that because in the old covenant, there is a scripture that prohibits tattoos. It's Leviticus 19.28. It says, you shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor tattoo any marks on you. I am the Lord. And this is in the Levitical law. It's part of uh, them being holy. Um, but again, you know, th- this is this is Israel's call to be a holy nation, to be separate. Um, and not that we're still not called to be that, uh, but this is under the old covenant. And so we are operating in the new covenant. So we're not going to take a Levitical law and make that uh, jurisdiction come over to the new covenant and call it sin. So that's why I say it's, I don't think it's a sin issue. There's nothing in the new Testament that talks about tattoos. Um, I, I do believe the, you know, like the, the 10 commandments, I think those are still authoritative. Um, even though those are in the old covenant, but the Levitical law, which is different, which is the sacrificial system f- to make us righteous before God has been fulfilled in Christ. That is what I'm talking about in that specific situation. So uh, now just because it's not wrong doesn't mean that it's right. You know, just because something's not wrong doesn't mean that like, you know, that it's the right thing to do. Um, it just becomes a kind of a neutral thing. But I think the Old Testament does give us some interesting principles that we can think about. If you're thinking about getting a tattoo or if you're thinking about getting more tattoos um, or if you just have this question about tattoos. And so lots of Christians say uh, they want to get scripture tattooed on their body. Uh, They want to get a cross tattooed on their body. They want to get some sort of statement or quote around their faith tattooed on their body. And, um, you know, they almost want to do it kind of as a form of worship or their identification with Christ. Like, hey, you know, yeah, I want everybody to know, like, my, it's my evangelism, right? You know, like, it's on my body. Or remind myself that, you know, uh, you know these passages, they're writ- written on my body. Um, and I, I think this is the wrong way to think. You know, so God tells us that there's a right way to worship him. Um, and it doesn't include tattoos. Um, so it's one of those things where, the you know, I think it's kind of the right idea, wrong way. Yeah. Um, if you want to go worship God, you don't need to tattoo something on your body to do so. Uh, the Lord is pretty clear on how to worship him. He says to do so. You worship God in spirit and in truth. Um, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't put a tattoo on your body, but but um, I, I don't think that's a necessarily a great justification for a form of worship. Yeah, th- there's a scripture that's actually referenced this idea in Deuteronomy uh, 12, 4 through 5. It says, You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way, but you shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose out of all your tribes and put his name and make his habitation there. Uh, th- this idea and this principle here in Deuteronomy is saying that that we don't want to worship God in the way that other religions worship their God. And we don't want to worship God in our own way of worshiping God. I mean, if, if we want to worship God in our own way, that's where we create idols. That's where we create things that are outside of the, the way that God wants to be worshiped. God gives us specific ways to worship him in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I think they're good principles that, uh, again, I think nullify the idea of using tattoos as a way to worship God and so I'm not saying that it's necessarily a, a sinful thing to get. I'm just saying is that don't do it because you want to worship or glorify God in that way. I don't think that, that God wants to be glorified in that way. Um, but I also don't think that it's necessarily biblically sinful that you do so. I'm just trying to correct the thinking around there. Um, and I think, yeah, Veronica's got a verse to, to share about. Yeah, I was making me think of the verse in First uh, Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 20, and it says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. I think this verse actually has the stronger argument. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to give some background on the principles here. but um, I feel like I use that verse all the time with the kids, but not related to tattoos. 
yeah, it, related well, to how they're controlling their bodies. Yeah, and this this scripture can all is you know it's it's the context of this passage in First Corinthians is about sexual immorality and the way that you use your body. It's mm-hmm. the temple of the Holy Spirit, but to understand really the gravity of what Paul is saying here in regards to your body being the temple of the Holy Spirit, uh, you got to really understand the holiness of the Old Testament tabernacle and temple. And you got to really look at the extreme ex- instructions. I was actually talking about this at dinner last night. Um, y- uh, like the in- extreme ex- instructions on how the temple and tabernacle was put together. I mean, there are chapters and chapters and chapters about the types of thread and the types of linen and the types of you know, stone and how they should look and how they should be designed and who should design them and where they should be placed and how long they should be and how tall they should be and how deep they should be. It's just amazing at the level of holiness that is placed upon the Old Testament tabernacle, which is the pre-temple, and then there's the actual temple in Jerusalem, and then now our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so, um, you know, people who defaced or entered improperly or operated in the temple without respect were actually killed by God. Like, that was a that was a thing. So you, you got to understand, again, when Paul says that we're the temple of the Holy Spirit without an Old Testament context— you could just kind of brush right past that. To a Jew, this is a massive deal. Um, and it's important to have that. Every single element in the temple was to honor God according to his instruction. If you did it your way, even if it was right thing, wrong way, you, you'd get killed for it. And, and so this is just thinking about that, that it's his temple uh, according to his instructions, and you get you don't get to use the temple or the elements in any way that you want to. Right, the showbread had a specific purpose; it was to be used specifically for God's purposes to uh, to glorify God. The altar had specific purposes; it wasn't to be used in other ways. It was used to be used in this way to glorify God. And so, the temple, all of its utensils, all of its members were to be used in a specific way. And again, this is important just to kind of have this perspective about our bodies because. There's absolutely a doctrinal parallel that's going on here that the New Testament writer Paul expects you to understand of the Old Testament when he says these words. Even though he's writing to a Greek audience, um, he knows that the Old Testament scriptures are recorded. So with this perspective, uh, it should at least give you pause um, of putting a permanent man-made sign on an eternal God-made temple. Because our bodies are eternal. They are eternal. I know, you know, is your tattoo going to be in heaven with you? Probably not. But the, the truth is, is that we should at least be careful about thinking about defacing our bodies in that way. Um, and, you know, it goes on to say in that passage, um, you're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. Um, that's just listen to that, those words. You're not your own. Uh, you were bought at a price. You're owned by somebody, by the Lord. Glorify God with your body. And so, honestly, I, I think getting a tattoo is your decision. It, it's, it's, or I should say it's not your decision. It's Jesus' decision. Do you really think that Jesus is going, hey, yeah, you know what? I think this is a good idea. I think you should get that tattoo put on your body permanently. Um, and you have to ask yourself that question. Uh, I'm, I don't want to be the arbiter of the Holy Spirit in your life. You get to do that. Um, is tattooing historically a Christian and holy thing, or is tattooing historically a unholy and worldly thing? Um, if you just look up the history of tattoos, you will see that it's the latter. Mm-hmm. And so it's just something to consider. Uh, does it make you more like Christ? Or does it make you more like the world? Um, you know, Christ obviously didn't have any tattoos that we know of, <laughs> but I don't think he's having any tattoos. So um, uh, my my just caution is to think about that. They're important questions to ask. So I, I don't think we can call it sin. I don't think that's the, the thing that we're talking about here. Um, I personally just don't think that it's wise. Um you know, if, if you have tattoos, don't worry about it. I'm not, I don't think I'm, I'm not trying to condemn you. Um, but what, you know, what's done is done in that matter. But I, I would seek the Lord on this matter and further tattoos. I think that, I think that's something worth checking out. 
Yeah, especially if you've already, if you've now heard this information. Yeah. Um, yeah, this actually makes me think of a friend of ours. He had actually, I don't know, probably a couple of years ago, had a, uh, he had an outline of a full sleeve done and yeah. half of it was complete, but mm-hmm. the other half was incomplete. And in the midst of that, uh, I don't know, few week p- time period of him going back in to finish it, he had a personal conviction um, about about tattoos and he actually decided to not finish his sleeve and to just allow it to be a testimony of change that of the change that God had done in his heart. Mm -hmm. And so our perspective is that it's a, yeah, it's a sit before the Lord kind of issue. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, the new Testament isn't direct on the issue, but we do have a variety of principles to use in making that decision. Um, so let's go ahead on to the next section and talk about alcohol. Um, we have had lots of friends who grew up in churches that are com- that completely prohibited alcohol. Um, and if you wanted to have a glass of wine at dinner, you had to actually go over into the next county uh, to the so liquor store over there. Yeah. So you're not seen by anybody uh, to buy a bottle of wine and, and almost like hide it. Mm-hmm. Um and then we know Christians who were far too tolerant of alcohol and they have several drinks every night. Don't really think about it. It's just a way of life for them now. Um, so what does the Bible really say about drinking alcohol? Yeah, I think showing those two groups, right? There's like the, we don't drink at all. It's a sin for everybody. Don't do it. And then like, hey, it's not a sin. Like, let's go and, you know, have drinks and let's go party and let's, you know, grace, grace, grace. And so there's, there's both sides of the, that parallel. And I kind of want to talk about what I think Jesus is talking about, which is in the middle. Uh, my mom was an alcoholic for many years. She died at the age of 54. Um, in, not in my care for that last moment, but in our care for the last couple years of her life. Um, and she had liver disease that was just too far by the time we we started caring for her. So we are fully aware. And for the, just for the record, for ever, for everyone who doesn't know her story, she had actually decided to stop drinking. She was she sober by the time she had passed away, but by then the damage had been done. Yeah. Um, and so she died of, of the damage that she had done. Yeah. The consequences. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So she was forgiven, but the consequences in the flesh were still there. And um, she did, I, we did get a chance to baptize her and see her come to the Lord in those last couple of years, which is great. So, uh, but she did pass away. Um, and I also just understand all the train wreck carnage that comes with alcoholism. So I just, I get it. Um, so just know that I'm speaking from real example around this, this topic. I do think it is theologically impossible to build a case that drinking is a universal sin. Um, and I'm going to break that down for you. So uh, drunkenness is a sin. Alcoholism is absolutely bondage to sin. Um, you know, scripture really teaches this principle that our bodies are never to be mastered by anything. The only thing to be mastered by is by the Holy Spirit, or by, uh, by Christ, right? We're, we're no longer slaves to our sin and bondage to our sin, but we're actually slaves to Christ, slaves to righteousness. Um, so we're not to be in bondage to anything in that way. But the Bible does permit drinking alcoholic beverages. And I'm going to talk about that. I'm not saying this so that you, you know, I'm giving everybody permission here. I'm actually saying this to give you a sober perspective on what it does say. And then I'm going to give you two reasons that scripture says that you shouldn't drink. Um, So I'll give you both both sides here. You know, Psalms uh, 104, 14 through 15 states that God gives us wine that uh, it makes glad the heart of men. Uh, the Proverbs talk about drinking wine from your own vineyard is a blessing. Uh, Jesus turns water into wine in John chapter 2. It says, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have all well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. And no, Jesus didn't turn it into non-alcoholic wine. <laughs> okay, this this argument. Th- that, that It wouldn't make any sense in that verse where it says, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You can see what's really going on there is that they've already been drinking a bit. They won't recognize the crappier wine usually. (laughs) And Jesus actually gives the best wine for last. And so, yeah, it's not a non-alcoholic wine there. Uh, First uh, first Timothy 5, 23, Paul tells Timothy, he says, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. Uh, uh, 
blog that I found yesterday when I was doing some prep for this, doctrineanddevotion.com. This guy does an article called The Theology of Wine. I thought it was pretty fascinating. Uh, he says, there are over 247 references to alcohol in Scripture. 40 are negative, you know, warnings about drunkenness, potential dangers of alcohol, etc. Uh, 145 are positive, signs of God's blessing, use in worship, uh, etc. And 62 are neutral. These are people, you know, falsely accused of being drunk, vows of abstinence, and so forth. But the Bible is anything but silent on the issue of wine, end quote. So... Uh, I thought it was just a fascinating thing. Yeah, it's not silent. It's actually very clear about the matter. But again, there's two reasons why a Christian shouldn't uh, drink wine or drink alcohol. And I'm going to break those down for you here. The first is if it violates your conscience. Um, you can read Romans 14 to learn more about the role of your conscience in your faith. It's actually a really fascinating chapter to check out. But James 4, 17 says, Whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. And this means that what might not be sin for you could be sin for another person. And you got to recognize that. There's things that are universal sin, and then there's things that are actual specific issues based off the conscience, based off conviction, that some people have freedom in and some people don't have freedom in. And so you need to realize that. And if you feel convicted about drinking alcohol, then for you, it is a sin to drink alcohol. Um, and if you feel convicted, don't drink it. Um, that's, just, that's just the easy answer for you there. Um, the second reason a Christian should not drink alcohol is if your freedom to drink alcohol actually causes another person to struggle or another person who struggles with drinking to sin. And this concept is called love limits liberty means that your love for others will limit your liberties um, of your own journey. And 1 Corinthians 8 through 10 is a really, it's the principle there. 8 through 10, you can read those chapters. It's a really good study. Um, 1 Corinthians 8, 9 through 13 reads, But beware, lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple... This is the issue that they're talking about, but let's just change that with drinking, okay? If anyone sees you with knowledge, knowledge meaning that you, you actually have permission, you understand that Christ is Lord and that you have grace in these matters. If anyone sees you with knowledge having a drink at a bar, and then back in the scripture, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to have a drink at the bar? And because of your knowledge, shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? But when you thus sin against the brethren, you wound their weak conscience. You sin against Christ. Therefore, if it says food, but if alcohol makes my brother stumble, I will never drink lest my, I make my brother stumble. That's another way to kind of read it. You can go read those verses. Again, it's 1 Corinthians 8, 9 through 13. But that concept is there, and that applies to a whole bunch of issues that you can make somebody stumble. If you got a guy that just got off of, um, you know, a, a intense porn addiction. Um, yeah, don't take him to the beach in Southern California in the summer. It's just filled with half-naked women. You know, it's thinking about other people. What could possibly stumble another brother or sister? Um, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 23-24, another popular verse or well-known verse, is all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Um, Romans 14, 12 through 13 says, So then each of us shall give account to, of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. you got to really be careful about, about this perspective with alcohol. Um, Romans 14, 21, it is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Like it, this is all over the new Testament caring for your brother in this way. And I feel like it's just kind of absent in the church. We just kind of like belligerently walk in this freedom that we have and not thinking about anybody. So the bottom line is, uh, drinking is not universally sinful drunkenness is sinful. Um, where's the line? My thought is if you can't clearly and properly present the gospel, um, 
you've had too much to drink. If you can't defend the gospel and and with clear conscience talk about Christian living and holiness and pray um, and memorize the word of scripture and recite scripture, you've had too much to drink. Um, you know, if you're the person that needs a drink every night when you get off work, you got a problem. Um, I'm not necessarily saying that you're quite an alcoholic yet, but you, you really need to watch what's happening there. Like, oh man, I need a drink. That word need, um, you know, just like food, wine is a blessing. Um, but just like anything else, it could become sinful if you don't exercise it with self-control. Yeah, Dale and I probably have, you could probably count on one hand the amount of drinks that we have per year. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're And it didn't used to always be that way. No. But we, we've s- we've shift, shifted s- uh, over the years because of just this perspective. Yeah, and um, we also have made the decision a couple of years ago to no longer post any pictures of us online drinking any alcoholic beverages. Um, just in case someone who is struggling with drinking is encouraged by our freedom. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you're starting to drink daily, we would encourage you to check your heart on that and evaluate if alcohol, if alcohol has become, uh, a coping mechanism for you and then, uh, see if you're allowing alcohol to take place of the work that only Christ can do in you. Yeah. Actually, we had a friend recently come into town and he said, yeah, I, I found myself all of a sudden just having a whiskey every single night. And then, uh, his wife just came up to him and said, hey, you're having whiskeys every single night. And he said, yeah, you know, you're right. And he stopped having whiskeys every night. Like it was that simple. So if you're seeing your spouse do that or someone in your life do that, just like, hey, looks like you're kind of drinking a lot lately. You should maybe just kind of pull that back. And if you get defensive, then <laughs> that almost is a... Uh, evidence. Evidence that maybe you should actually check your heart on <laughs> on the issue. Yeah. Um, So next, let's talk about marijuana and CBD. Mm. Um, Some states, like our state, lovely Oregon here, Mm. (laughs) um, have legalized these substances, and they're causing discussions all throughout the church. Um, So are these substances uh, that Christians should be engaging with? Um, If people can drink, why shouldn't they be able to use marijuana? Um, What does the Bible say about these things? Yeah. Um, how many marijuana plants do you think that are around our house right now? Oh my goodness. <laughs> hundreds of thousands? Yeah. So there, there's hemp uh, fields. Th- yeah, everywhere. Everywhere. So they're not marijuana they're not, fields. Yeah, they're hemp. Um, but however, it still smells so strong because we live out in the country. Yeah. And so even though we don't have any on our property and even the properties touching our property don't have any drive down the road a quarter mile a half mile and they're everywhere yeah and if you come out in the morning after it's been a dewy morning and there's moisture in the air and it just like punches you in the face how strong the odor is yeah so it's it's something where it's around everywhere up here um there's like probably a thousand dispensaries (laughs) it seems like all over our town in terms of just that came up within the year that it got legalized yeah they're, they're just all over the place yeah so there's just there's marijuana everywhere here in Oregon and so it's a constant conversation um, I'm gonna first talk on marijuana then I'm gonna talk about CBD and so I want to make sure that people understand how marijuana is different from alcohol because mm-hmm. they are they're two different substances and sometimes Christians again want to put them in it's like hey if you can drink alcohol then why can't you smoke marijuana you know what's the what's the difference here especially there's all these other consumption formats now you know I can drink it I can drop it in my eye whatever you know um, and you know th- the the main thing is that you can consume alcohol and not be drunk you can't smoke marijuana and not be high and so that's the major distinction there that uh, you need to recognize is that they are they are different in terms of their consumption um, and sobriety uh, formats in terms of how, you know what it actually does to your body. Um, you know, so my personal take is that marijuana is is a substance that removes sobriety, and there's so many scriptures. First Peter chapter one, chapter four, chapter five, First Timothy three tells Christians to be sober minded. Um, so I, I just I, I look at it differently than I look at alcohol. Um, so for for that reason, I can't really vouch for marijuana as being okay for the Christian. Um, I, I would say that um, that in some cases for recreational uses, it's I think it would be sinful because you're you're removing your sobriety. Um, and uh, you know, I, 
I know that some people take it for like legitimate medical reasons that exist out there. I think those are the exceptions and I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about recreational use for people. Um, and so I don't even want to get into the details of that conversation necessarily. So if you happen to be one of those people that uses it recreationally, you know, or uses it uh, medicinally, I think a lot of people have abused that and, you know, oh, you know, I got a pain in my left foot. Marijuana makes it feel better. You know, I think it's just kind of become this thing. And I do think there are some science I've read that has some like legitimate science for a handful of specific diseases that actually reve relieve certain parts of really terrible symptoms. Um, but again, I don't think that's the, the mainstream. I think that's just for those specific groups of people. The second reason I wouldn't endorse Christians to use marijuana is because it's currently federally illegal, even though it might be legal in your state. Um, I, I just think that's an above reproach thing. Romans 13, one through two says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Um, so I just say, be careful. Um, in terms of, you know, especially if it's not legal in your state. Um, I, again, I'm not endorsing anybody to, to, to use marijuana. I don't think that you should. I think that it's, again, I, I land the side. I think that it's sinful. I think that it steals your sobriety away. Um, I think um, um, I haven't seen a lot of fruit come out of people that use marijuana on a regular basis. Um, I don't see historically the church using marijuana. I don't see... Uh, you know, the uh, Jesus and any reference referencing it to this. I don't think that it's a, a, you know, God made it so it's good. I'm like, well, you know, there's all types of stuff on the planet that are, that the Lord made and they're not necessarily good for our bodies just because it's created doesn't mean it's good for our bodies. Um, and so I, I think there's a lot of conversation to happen there. In regards to CBD, uh, which again is a THC free version of marijuana, it's, you know, hemp, um, and uh, the THC is the chemical compound that really makes you feel high and that's removed for the hemp plants. Uh, I don't think there's really any sin there. I think that if you, have, if you want to use CBD oil, I think that's fine. I do think you need to be careful on sharing it publicly because still in this time where there's a transition era of like people becoming comfortable with the legality of marijuana, um, people using CBD could imply to some people that if you endorse CBD, that for some reason you can endorse marijuana. Um, that's definitely not the case with me. But I, again, you, you just want to be careful that your actions aren't necessarily teaching somebody that you're endorsing something else that's similar. And so I, I just think you just need to be careful about that. So I think the whole conversation is wrapped up in, um, you know, th do they make you more like Christ? Um and thinking of others before yourself. I think those two themes are really important around tattoos, alcohol, and marijuana. So hopefully that helps you guys make some good decisions and that this can be a resource for people that are asking that question because we get it pretty often. I wanted to close with this episode's Real Christianity Resources. And so we've been partnering with a variety of publishers, just getting different resources that are, I think are higher thinking. We, we're just... Like Veronica and I get sent lots of books and some of these books are just like, like they're just the run of the mill, like everybody's saying the same thing, not really profound, not really bringing much fruit, middle of the road kind of Christian stuff that's just kind of being pumped out of the machine. And not that the Lord's not using that stuff, but we were starting to look for higher thinking, deeper theological, dense content for our audience. So what, what, what kind of publishers publish that stuff? And so I have a couple resources I want to show you. I'm going to pick them up off the table right here. So they're, um, if you're watching the video, you can see these. Um, these are the Geneva series commentaries of a few books that I got here. And this is from uh, Banner of Truth. And so we're partnering with Banner of Truth for this month. And they have some really great resources. This is banneroftruth.org. And, you know, you've used commentaries when you've prepared messages before uh, how like how how have they helped you oh i love looking at commentaries it helps me understand the passages the history way more than i would have known otherwise if i would have just read it 
yeah. as it is. And you, you, Veronica's used Blue Letter Bible and, you know, online, things like that. I, I like some of these print versions. So, you know, I have the Ephesians one here uh, that, again, it's just a verse-by-verse commentary. And it's just, you know, uh, one person's commentary. So there, there's a handful of places that you can find a variety of commentaries. I love it when a bunch of commentaries align in the same interpretation on a verse because it really makes me feel like, okay, that definitely is the right interpretation. Um, I always say when when... <laughs> You know, when someone from the 1400s, 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, five different guys from five different generations who've never met each other interpret this verse the exact same way, it's probably the right interpretation. Um, and so I have First Timothy and Titus here, First and Second Timothy and Titus here as well. And then I have Romans, which again, is just great when you want to pull out one verse and you want to just look at, you know, the context, man, just so rich and deep and dense. So they have a whole Bible, the entire Bible done in this Geneva series of commentaries. And so it's been around for a while. Again, you can see the Romans version. If you guys want to pick up any of the commentaries, they have several commentary sets. You can just go to banneroftruth.org uh, and use the code Real Christianity. Uh, they'll give you 30% off. It's not going to last forever. So if you're listening to this several months or years later, it might not work right now. But it does work right now if you want to order them soon. And it's cheaper than you're going to get them on Amazon. So fill your library with good theological resources and stop reading kind of the run-of-the-mill stuff. There's so much m- greater content out there. Um, usually it's written a couple hundred years ago too. <laughs> so uh, on that episode, or on, on that note, this is the end of this episode. And uh, thanks for joining us. We'll see you guys next week. See ya.